I grew up in the west of Ireland, uh, a place called Leitrim, in a small town called Mohill. Uh, in fact, people say it's the west of Ireland, but it's actually east of the Shannon. So strictly speaking, it should be in Leinster. Uh, a small town, a very business-like town, with really good educational system, tremendous schools. And uh, stayed there until I was about 12, and then I was sent off to boarding school. And that was the end of my, if you like, association with Mohill as, 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 as a child. Of course, summer holidays were always spent in Mohill playing tennis, uh, football, fishing, doing all the things that kids at that age could do. And then, of course, me medicine uh, always interested me because my father was a doctor, my uncle was a doctor, my grandfather was a doctor, and uh, I never really thought of doing anything else. I wouldn't have had the brains to do engineering. My father was a bit the same. He uh, would have liked to have been an engineer, but his mother, who was a formidable woman, said, no, you'll be a doctor, and that was it. He had no choice. Uh, so I never uh, kind of exposed myself to anything else other than the idea of doing medicine. And of course, listening to stories from my father about the College of Surgeons when he was here, uh, it always sparked an interest. And uh, he told me stories about legendary teachers here in the college, like Tom Gary and so on. So that interest in medicine, and specifically in the College of Surgeons, was always there from a very early age. The, uh, my, my time in RCI, RCSI was fantastic. The, the first year was difficult. It was pre-med. There were uh, students who didn't make it through pre-med, and uh, it was tough. Um, probably hadn't been quite prepared for moving from boarding school into pre-med, living in a digs, and trying to come to terms with chemistry and physics and so on. Subjects I had done, but they were a bit more difficult here. So the first year was spent studying, and I think I went out once in, in, in first year. It was the night we won the inter-year rugby competition, and uh, we had a really good team back then. Uh, unfortunately, some of the lads didn't make it through. Uh, but then after that, uh, things got a lot easier. And once we got into the, the sort of first year, second year, pathology, microbiology, anatomy, I could have done without it. I didn't really like anatomy very much. And then, of course, when we hit the hospital, uh, it really exploded and it was fantastic. We were down in the Richmond Hospital or in Jervis Street. I was a student in the Richmond and my father had been there before me. And it was an historic hospital, legendary figures of Dublin Medicine and of RCSI working with us. We were working with them day in, day out, learning from them as students and afterwards as postgraduates. So really, uh, RCSI was, was dead easy after the first year and <laughs> took a, a, I suppose I, I paid more attention uh, to, to life outside medicine as well uh, for, for those years afterwards. There are lots of stories I can remember but I'm not sure they'll all be for repetition <laughs> at this stage. So. So, so, so rugby in the College of Surgeons back in the 1960s and 70s was actually played at a, quite a high level. Now. Uh, at that time we would have played the second team of the senior clubs and we never had much difficulty in getting out one team we often had difficulty getting out two teams but we had lots of really good players uh, so it was great fun we trained in Bird Avenue we played in Bird Avenue we did tours all over the place tours to England tours to Wales uh, we got involved in the Hospitals Cup myself and two of my colleagues from uh, Trinity and Vincent's have just produced a book on the history of Dublin Hospitals Rugby. So it's been really well received. We've sold about eight or 900 copies. Uh, the college were very helpful in getting that book out. So it's a history of rugby in Dublin medicine, if you like. Um, uh, but then uh, we also had a problem in trying to get students who were particularly good at rugby who would have played for other clubs, especially Bechtel Rangers, to get them to come back and play in the college. Some like... Uh, Bjorn Lofrod, a Norwegian student, John Rayfield, unfortunately, who is now dead, who was on the English panel for many years. I mean, our level of rugby in the college wasn't what it should be, so they played for other clubs. But on one infamous occasion, I think when I was captain, we, we managed to get all of these top-class players back to play for the college under an assumed name. And we played Clontarf, and uh, the word got oh, we hammered them. We hadn't won a match for a number of years, so we hammered Clontarf, and then the word got out that there were illegal players playing for the College of Surgeons. 
Uh, the Leinster branch took a very dim view of it, as, as indeed did Clontarf. Uh, vengeance uh, was wreaked on us in the months afterwards. So we probably shouldn't have done that, but uh, I just felt it was an opportunity to, to win a game <laughs> against, against a team that was pretty good. Uh, so yeah, we, we, uh, it, was, uh, it made life uh, interesting. After rugby was the Toby Jug. Toby Jug was a famous public house down on South King Street, run by Frank Swift and his wife. And they, together, husband and wife, they had no children. I would say they bankrolled many students through the college. And not once did a student ever default on the loan. When they would have qualified, the loans were repaid instantly. And uh, it's gone now. Rice's was the other pub where a lot of students used to go. Not rugby playing students, more uh, students who played hockey and so on. That was just on the corner of Stephen's Green, where the Stephen's Green Shopping Centre is now. Uh, but they were two places where we spent a lot of time uh, learning as we went along as well. So, In terms of going through, through RCSI and the different subjects, there was the preclinical and the postclinical. And one that stands out, and I'm sure most people won't even remember it, was a course called Applied Physiology. Now, Applied Physiology was given to us in a series of lectures on a Friday afternoon when most people were in the green cinema uh, mitching off school by an incredible physician called Brian Main. Brian Main was a physician in the Meath Hospital. He uh, had been a prisoner of war in Singapore uh, during the Second World War. He delivered these lectures uh, after physiology and before medicine. So he was applying physiology to, to, to the study of medicine before we had seen many patients, but after we had learned a lot of physiology. And they were spellbinding. He used to sit quietly, Occasionally he would get up and just write something on the board, no PowerPoint, but just talked about his experience, talked about physiology, was a masterful teacher and he had a huge influence on me. He was fantastic. And then afterwards, um, as I said, some things like anatomy I wasn't really interested in at all. I was never going to be a surgeon. I knew that from, from day one. But physiology and uh, biochemistry interested me. And then, of course, when we started in pathology, uh, I really kind of got to terms with that very quickly. Uh, wasn't the best in the class in it, but uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. And D Dermot Holland, who was the professor of pathology at the time, uh, Paddy Fitzpatrick, uh, many, uh, Ellen Morehouse, of course, in microbiology, I mean, they were three outstanding teachers. And from that time on, really, I always had pathology at the back of my mind, or medicine, which was really just applied pathology. So then as years went by, medicine, uh, surgery, internship, and so on, did medicine, did a membership afterwards, but still at the back of my mind was pathology. So I headed off out to St. Vincent's to do uh, pathology and it was really tough. The first six months of that were something like I'd never done before. I had to learn how to occupy the day, looking down the microscope, doing autopsies, away from patients. That was tough, uh, but eventually it clicked. And then I, uh, after Vincent's then, I went over to London to the Westminster Hospital and uh, got a really good experience there. But at the same time, I was missing the clinical medicine. So I kept looking around for something that would make me more clinically relevant. And at the same time, use my pathology skills. And that's when neuropathology uh, sort of re reared its head and then I took off to Canada. I only did neuropathology in Canada and uh, I wouldn't have got there if it hadn't been for Sean Murphy was a neurologist in the Richmond Hospital and he had the contacts with a great man called Henry Barnett who was head of neurology in London, Ontario. His son was at medical school here in the College of Surgeons and Charles Drake who was a famous, uh, world famous neurosurgeon whose son and grandson both did medicine here in the college. So uh, with those sort of contacts it, it was the only place to go and at that time London, Ontario was one of the top neuroscience centres in the world. You had Charles Drake in neurosurgery, you had uh, Henry Barnett in neurology, and then John Kaufman, who was my mentor in neuropathology. Uh, it was completely an uh, interwoven department. Uh, it was really neurosciences where everything was integrated horizontally. So there was an incredible opportunity to learn from neurologists, from neurosurgeons, from residents rotating through neuropathology. It, it was a spectacular time. Uh, you know, in, in a way, at the end, we didn't want to come back, but we came back to the Richmond Hospital in 1984. And of course, we were told the Richmond was going to open tomorrow and then next day in Manana. 
And in 1986, I went back to Canada. I did it Oakham, and I was about to sign a contract uh, to go back and stay in Canada when Barry Desmond, who was Minister for Health, uh, announced the opening of Beaumont in 12 months' time. So I said, crikey, what am I going to do? Stay or go back? So we stayed and been here since the start of Beaumont and never looked back, really. You know, So that was a big decision at the time because the attractions were there in Canada. Moving to Beaumont Hospital from the Richmond was f fairly traumatic. The actual physical move itself took place on the 23rd of November. I think I made about eight trips on the back of an, an open back lorry, carrying uh, freezers, fridges, microtomes, everything from the old labs in the Richmond Hospital out to Beaumont. And when we got to Beaumont, it, to put, put it mildly, it was a bit chaotic. Uh, car parking wasn't what it should be. The telephone system wasn't great. The bleep system wasn't great. Uh, but eventually, over the following years, with sort of integration of the two hospitals, that was a big thing. Uh, Gerald Street and Richmond coming together. We were equally paranoid about each other. But eventually all that settled down and Bowman turned into what it is today. Uh, a world-class hospital. Uh, the links with the College of Surgeons have been strengthened massively over the last uh, 15 or 20 years since Cahill Kelly came into the college and Bowman is now a major university hospital, uh, obviously with its major affiliation to RCSI and part of the RCSI group of hospitals. And that has been wonderful for students, wonderful for healthcare delivery in the whole of the northeastern part of, of Dublin. And then of course, uh, neurosurgery at Bowman is uh, the national specialty, along with renal transplantation. So it's, it was incredibly busy. Uh, my time there has shot past, largely because I was so busy uh, and then in 1995 I got a colleague, uh, Dr. Francesca Brett, and then things looked up from then. And now I think, uh, I think this week or next week, there'll be five brain pathologists in Bowman. So it has grown spectacularly uh, over, over those years. Uh, but it's been great really, I've enjoyed every minute of it. Coming into the college uh, and giving lectures, we're a bit intimidating at times. You have two or 300 students there and you know that the standard is extremely high. And you know, you can't do like in the old days, come in and just give a lecture and breeze off. It has to be prepared, it has to be updated. If it's not, there'll be an email from the student that night asking you about something you left out. So it's uh, more demanding than it ever used to be. Uh, students are more demanding and, and rightly so. The standard of medical school education has gone through the roof and uh, especially in RCSI, where the students are really well looked after. how to learn, how to teach, how to sort of make yourself better at it. That's a difficult question to answer. And I look back to the people that influenced me and I don't think that they realized what good teachers they were, but more importantly, what really good mentors they were. And, and there are a, number of them a number of them stick out. Uh, and they all had one thing in common. They all taught me how to observe, not just to look, but to see and, and to realize what I was looking at and to integrate it and to try and understand it. Uh, and there are, I suppose, four or five people like that. It came naturally to them. Uh, but preparation is important when it comes to teaching. Uh, it can look easy at times, but that's only because the preparation has gone into it. It doesn't matter whether it's a lecture or a small group tutorial. And being able to, um, to empathize with students and, and to listen. The, the best teachers are those who listen. The best teacher I ever had was a man called Harry Coonan who was a physician in the Richmond Hospital. He never said a word, never said anything. But you just learned from him. You just knew if you'd done something wrong or you'd done something right, you got a grunt, that was it. He, he was an extraordinary teacher, but never said anything. So listening, I think, is probably the best and biggest uh, secret to being a good teacher. As I've had more time uh, over the last few years, I've tried to spend a bit more time preparing and uh, trying to step inside the skin of a student and see what they want rather than trying to follow the books or follow the, 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 the programme. What do the students need? How would I like to sort of remember this particular talk? What, what's important in it for, for me as a student? So if we can step inside the student's skin and, and listen, I think that's probably the secret really. So, so receiving this award, um, I suppose, uh, first of all, the, the shock. Uh, I was in South Africa three or four weeks ago 
I was in a friend's house in the swimming pool. The phone went. Sandra said, there's a fella called Cahill Kelly looking for you. I said, what does Cahill Kelly want? So he, he told me sort of quietly that this was going to happen. And I couldn't believe it. I mean, how does anybody know whether I'm a good or a bad teacher? Or, you know, so obviously the college has its own sort of sources and informants. But it's, 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 uh, I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled. I, I can't really put into words what it means. Uh, at the end of my career, it's 55 years ago since I walked into the college. And at this stage, to get an award like this means everything to me. And it means that the bit of effort I put into it has been noticed by somebody. So, so I'm, I'm delighted. So, so are my family.